um, recording. I think I'll check with you that that's okay, right? Yeah. Thanks. Oh, Kieran, could you start recording, please? Thank you. All right. Um, I'll introduce our speaker. Very, very lucky today to have Jesse Liu, who uh, did his PhD um, at Oxford before moving to Chicago as a Granger Fellow. Um, and now he's at the University of Cambridge as a Junior Research Fellow, um, working within the ATLAS collaboration, but really focusing on new physics searches and precise tests of the standard model um, as we'll hear about today. So please take it away. All right, well, thank, thank you, Teresa, for uh, inviting me and everyone for joining. Uh, so today I want to present these uh, two papers that I've uh, worked on in the past couple of years. Uh, one is on the Atlas experiment uh, and more uh, unusually using heavy ion collisions to uh, try and to, uh, make precise tests of the standard model, uh, specifically the tau anomalous magnetic moment, the G minus two. And the second is completely different, uh, a new broadband dark matter experiment trying to look for uh, milli electron volt axions uh, that combines uh, these astroparticle physics with quantum technology. But before I begin, I want to uh, tell the story of how we traditionally make new discoveries in science. So I want to cast our minds back to the 18th century where Herschel uh, discovered in 1781, the planet Uranus, right? And what do you do when you make such a profound discovery, right? This was the first planet we've discovered since the five known in antiquity. Uh, well, do, you know, do you just retire and go on holiday and declare science is done? Right, of course not, right? You measure its properties, you study how it moves as precisely as you can. And that's what people did for over six decades until uh, Le Verrier started to notice that there was something a bit funny with its orbit, right? And being a believer in Newtonian dynamics in the 19th century, proposed a new planet to correct for this anomaly and uh, sent the coordinates to the Berlin Observatory where Gaia and the rest pointed the telescope at uh, the, the coordinates and as the story goes, discovered Neptune to within one degree of the prediction. So this was a spectacular triumph of classical physics and people were excited, not just because they had discovered yet another planet, but because they have discovered a new tool for making further discoveries, right? Which is precision calculation and precision measurement. So they started scouring the data, you know, maybe there could be more anomalies and deviations. And so they found Mercury's orbit was also deviating from the expectation by just over 40 arc seconds per century. And they proposed this new planet in very, the same vein, the planet Vulcan, and they thought that they were seeing you know, the planet transit across the face of the sun. Uh, it was some false alarms that turned out just to be sunspots. And of course, this paved the first empirical steps to general relativity. So why am I telling you this story? It's really to emphasize that precision measurements really do revolutionize science, right? So discovering new planet, that brings fame and fortune, right? To the 19th century scientists, but also uh, to the recent Nobel Prize in discovering exoplanets, right, in 2019. And, uh, but, but of course, discovering new planets, that actually left the known physical laws unchanged. And yet it was actually by studying a planet we had known about since the classical civilization, that is actually what led to these transformative understanding that space and time is not just a static background, it is a dynamical entity that induces gravity. And there's a beautiful uh, parallel in particle physics, right? Quantum field theory, the language of particle physics, there's the story of the electron, right, which is the first particle we had discovered, and also by measuring precession, right, wobbles, just like Mercury's perihelion uh, precession, uh, to the per mil precision, that did not reveal any new particles, but it actually led to something arguably even more profound, which was the groundbreaking evidence that the vacuum is not empty or static, but actually a dynamical entity teeming a sea of particles and antiparticles popping in and out of existence and inducing these quantum loops. And so the bottom line of this story is that by studying the ordinary 
That is actually what harbored some of the most extraordinary surprises in nature. And I think many people in our community now are cautiously optimistic and excited because we may be witnessing history repeat itself. There's now arguably some persistent, widespread, indirect evidence for new physics beyond the standard model. So I take two of these classes. One are these lepton anomalies, where across several observatories, uh, laboratories, sorry, around the world, and across all the three different flavors, we're now seeing some uh, funny tensions between expectations and measurements. Uh, for example, these uh, anomalous magnetic moment measurements in the electrons and muons, as well as these heavy flavor decays uh, to uh, leptons. And these could be new particles induced by precisely these quantum fluctuations. Now, from the astrophysics point of view, there's also dark matter, and there's now ubiquitous evidence, unambiguous evidence for the existence of dark matter, and really the full phenomenological variety, diversity of evidence ranging from subgalactic scales, right, not just galaxy rotation curves, but also through to lensing, galaxy cluster uh, collisions, all the way through to the cosmological scales with the CMB. So I've been addressing these uh, two particular examples of new physics beyond the standard model with these uh, two papers that I was alluding to at the beginning. So I'll focus on this tau g minus two, which is, addresses the kind of the more leptonic anomaly side, as well as this uh, new experiment looking for actually on dark matter. All right, so some two years ago now, uh, there was this really exciting announcement at Fermilab uh, that recaptured international attention uh, regarding this G minus two, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. So here it's just some screenshots of the New York Times, as well as the uh, nature covering this result right here is this uh, muon storage ring at Fermilab. And here is that now famous uh, four and a bit sigma tension that they reported two years ago. Of course, there are now some lattice calculations that sit somewhere in between that kind of uh, muddy these waters a little bit, uh, but I, I won't comment on that uh, further. So just to remind people who aren't used to thinking about this uh, every day. G minus two is a foundational test of quantum field theory, and it's really just addressing a very simple uh, question of how does light interact with matter. Right? So we all learn and teach our undergraduates uh, that this G, this gyromagnetic ratio, is this proportionality constant in front of this spin uh, magnetic coupling. And Dirac in 1928 with his equation predicted this is two. And in modern field theory language, this is the tree level interaction between photons and fermions. And therefore G minus two are all the loop interactions. So Schwinger predicted this in 1948 to be alpha, the fine structure constant of electromagnetism, to by pi, this is such a profound uh, landmark result that it's engraved on his gravestone here. And of course, we're now excited uh, to continue measuring the G minus two because we could be probing new particles running in the loop by these quantum fluctuations. So for example, in this case, we could have some spin zero muons uh, and perhaps some uh, fermionic dark matter particles that could be enhancing these uh, contributions. So the state of the art with the electron and muon magnetic moments is extraordinary precision. I think this is really a modern scientific triumph. So the electron G minus two is known to some 13 decimal places now, really extraordinary, right? So I write it out in full to see it in all its uh, beauty, right? And you can see it's both the experiment and predictions that are known, uh, that are tested to, uh, to uh, the, the 12 decimal place here. The muon is uh, now known to about 10 decimal places here, and it's a similar scenario where the experimental and theoretical uncertainties are competitive. But the elephant in the room is what about the heaviest laptop, the tau G minus two. And this is where we see some truly shocking experimental ignorance. So you just look up the particle data group value and they quote a measurement from 2004, right? It's a Delphi measurement at the Large Electron Positron Collider, minus 0.02 plus or minus 0.02. That is an order of magnitude away from the theoretical prediction uh, that's known to far better precision. And that's a bit like saying my hand is one meter plus or minus one meter, right? The 10 year olds I do outreach with can tell me that is a terrible measurement. But I think the even more shocking observation here is that we are not even testing 
the now more than 70 year old one loop QED prediction made by Schwinger in 1948. Alpha over two pi, you can see he got the first two significant figures correct. And that's because the leading contribution to this is one loop QED. And if you just summarize the uh, current state of the art, you can see uh, I placed the electron, muon, and tau g minus twos all on the same plot, but I had to inflate the error bars of the electron g minus two by a factor of 10 to the nine, because if I didn't, it would be the width of an atom on your screen. So that really shows how uh, striking this level of ignorance is. You can see the tau g minus two so didn't inflate the error bar at all. But this is not just a pressing problem. This is an interesting open problem. Right? So this huge uncertainty implies there's a huge room for new physics. And there's certainly no shortage of model building by our theory colleagues uh, for the electron and muon g minus two. Here's just a selection of papers even before the uh, 2021 announcement by Fermilab. And just one canonical example is the, uh, the supersymmetric scenarios where the uh, enhancement to the g minus two scales quadratically with the lepton mass. And because the tau is heavier, this implies the tau could be potentially more than two orders of magnitude more sensitive to this class of new physics than the muon g minus two. And there's certainly also no shortage of searches for new particles, the scalar leptons, uh, during uh, inside the Alice and CMS collaboration. So here's the plot that I made. Uh, and uh, you can see on the horizontal axis, the masses of these scalar leptons that could be running inside the loop, as well as the dark matter particle on the y-axis. And you can see there's a whole plethora of searches. And my PhD was this little orange slither uh, just here. Right? So that's what a PhD looks like uh, last decade. But the tau g minus two is where there is very little consensus for how we can make some progress. There's been a few papers, a handful of papers around that have been suggesting several future uh, proposals using facilities that may or may not ever be built for future data sets. But as a younger scientist, you know, I want to actually try and measure something uh, in the very near future. So we had to think different. And this is where I came along a couple of years ago and uh, had to propose a new strategy using heavy ion collisions. So this is a creative theory paper that I wrote with my uh, with, well, then a um, postdoc at, at Oxford, Lydia Beresford here. And we had to overcome uh, two classes of the status quo. Right, so the general assumption is that to make precise measurement, you need to build a lepton collider. And uh, generally, the assumption is that heavy ion collisions at hadron colliders are too messy to be interesting uh, for looking for new particles, certainly uh, via precision measurements. And so by overcoming this, we certainly surprise the community. And uh, it's actually very pleasing now to see that this uh, Lydia has now gone off to uh, to DAISY, the National Lab at Germany, uh, as a staff scientist funded by a one and a half million euro grant to work on this kind of physics, and is now leading a new group, uh, just hired a, a postdoc and a PhD student here, Savannah and Veronica. So back then, a couple of years ago, we were asking a very simple question of how would we see the, these processes of gamma gamma to tau tau, which is a process that I show here, uh, because, and we studied this process because the, when we looked at the most precise measurement uh, at the large electron positron collider, we found that Delphi used this diagram here, which is an electron positron. They emit two photons and they fuse together to create a pair of tau leptons. And so uh, this actually uh, produces uh, a rate of about 200,000 events across all of their data sets. And so when we thought about how could we bring this to the Hadron Collider world, we soon realized this had actually never been observed at a Hadron Collider. And we thought maybe we should just try and proceed analogously, just the simple lowest hanging fruit. And we thought maybe it would be good to use lead ions because lead has this uh, feature where it has 82 protons. And in this amplitude, you can see there are these two factors of Z, the proton number, and uh, remember you square amplitudes to get a cross section. And uh, this is why there's a factor of Z to the four enhancement in the cross section uh, and 82 to the power of four is a, an enormous number. And therefore the cross section is actually enormous. And we could have actually had uh, about a million events per experiment per month uh, at the time that we wrote this paper. 
So I've been naturally giving quite a few seminars about this and it uh, going around uh, giving the, this theoretical proposal. And I'm very pleased to be able to say now that this is no longer just theoretical uh, fantasy, it is experimental reality. Right? So both CMS and the Atlas experiment at CERN uh, last year uh, announced the observation of this process at uh, a Hadron Collider using these ultra-peripheral lead, lead collisions that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and yeah, but this is a, a real uh, vote of confidence with our, to our proposal. So usually when people talk about heavy ion collisions, they think of these kinds of events, right? Spectacular fireworks display with thousands of particles saturating our detector. How on earth can you make precise electric weak measurements in this kind of busy environment? But the kind of events I want to look, uh, talk about today are these breathtakingly clean events. And, you know, I come from a generation that has never looked at a lepton collider data set, right? Lepton collider events. We are mu very much more used to these hadron collider environments. And so it's actually really striking to be able to see this red line here. That's a muon in the CMS detector. And these three yellow lines, those are the pions. And uh, this is uh, one of the hallmark trident signatures for this uh, tau pair event in our detector. So what's going on here? Well, usually we think of these head-on collisions uh, of lead ions or protons, and this creates this uh, exotic state of matter called a quark-gluon plasma that nuclear physicists are extremely interested in studying. But what I am talking about are these uh, collisions events where the lead ions miss each other. They just fly straight past each other. And it's actually the photons from the electromagnetic fields that interact, that source these photons that collide instead to create these pairs of matter and antimatter particles, right? So this is using the LHC as a photon-photon collider. So we can make this more precise. Right? So usually when you think of a photon collider, you might think of shining two laser beams at each other. Well, that is a very uh, narrow band, right? A uh, photon collider where you just collide at a very uh, uh, at one energy. But the LHC is actually a very broad band gamma gamma collider. It had, the photon spectrum is what I've plotted here. This is the gamma gamma luminosity as a function of the invariant mass of the two photons, right? So you convert the energy of the photon into a mass. That's what's plotted on the horizontal axis here. And the two lines, one is coming from the lead lead case, the black line, and the red line comes from the proton case. And so you can see how the black line is much higher at lower values. This is where we have some advantages with producing these uh, difermions and a uh, if you want to access the highest masses, you would use the protons because they can access the, uh, well into the TV scale. And it's really amazing to have been seeing in the past few years, various experimental breakthroughs that are opening a really rich science program, right? So a few years ago, we observed what is known as light by light scattering where photons in Maxwell's equations, right? Maxwell's equations are linear, when two photons come along, they will just simply pass through each other, the super, they will superpose the amplitude and then they'll go on their merry ways. But in quantum mechanics, you get this loop interaction that induces a self-coupling of the photon at one loop. And this allows the photons to scatter. And that's exactly what we observed in Atlas a few years ago. Now, I was also working on uh, this so-called forward proton scattering. And this is where, when you have to, these protons just flying past each other, they actually fly straight down the beam pipe, and you can actually detect these protons just over 200 meters away using uh, these so-called Roman pot detectors. And that's what I was working on for a couple of years. We also observed the production of WW production at, uh, in Atlas just two years ago. And uh, I will talk about this uh, di tau production that is the first tau g minus two measurement in nearly two decades. So just to show you how we calculate cross sections, right? So this is the one slide on a bit of theory here. So we want to evaluate this uh, number on the left-hand side, so the cross section of this process, uh, two photons turning two tau leptons. So we do numerical integration uh, using Monte Carlo methods. That's what this blue thing here is. And there are two other bits. One is the photon flux. These are these Ns here, right? And it turns out the photon flux, you can actually just look up in classical field theory of relativistic moving charges. That's Jackson chapter 15, section four, it turns out. I certainly never got down to that, that chapter. And 
you get you find this expression here for the photon flux, uh, which contains this z squared, uh, the fine structure constant, and this x is the fractional uh, energy carried by the photon. And then inside this expression, you have these capital Ks. Uh, these are the modified Bessel functions of the second kind. Now, I certainly don't remember what those are, but these special functions, the important thing is that they are implemented in Fortran, right? because we use Magraft, the Monte Carlo uh, computer code, uh, to evaluate this uh, expression here, and uh, Magraft was written in Fortran. Now, the last part is the quantum mechanical process. This is the, the amplitude uh, at the uh, QED level. And the way we evaluate this is that we use this formalism called effective field theory, uh, which is this, uh, which, uh, yeah, there's this operator here that modifies the interaction between the photon and the fermion line here, the taus. And uh, this operator here induces this little blob here, this new physics contribution. And there are three of these contributions, the standard model and then the BSM amplitudes that interfere. And this little blob here, if you write it out in full, right, this is the effective field theory uh, expression of the G minus two. So heuristically, this is the lepton uh, part and the, the sigma mu nu is the relativistic spin tensor, right, so it's the commutator. Uh, the commutator of uh, the gamma matrices, which contains the, uh, the S uh, spin uh, operator. And this is contracted into the photon. And uh, in the non-relativistic limit, this operator turns into this S dot B interaction. And so once you put all this together, you, know, you turn the crank, this plot here shows you the cross section evaluated as a function of when you dial these, uh, uh, th these uh, variations in the, uh, this uh, spin, uh, magnetic operator here. And what you'll notice is that the cross-section actually decreases when you go to negative values. And that's due to this middle term here, this interference term here. There's some destructive interference that causes the cross-section to decrease before it rises again. So that's just to give you a sense of how we actually uh, make these kinds of uh, calculations of these photon collisions and modifying it with G minus two. So back to the experimental results, uh, it, it was really fantastic to see last year when CMS announced their result. Uh, this was the, the first measurement of this cross-section of lead ions uh, colliding and turning into these two tau leptons by the, the collision of uh, two photons here. And you can see this is their measurement here. It's still statistically limited. And it was uh, doubly beautiful to see that uh, the, the calculation from what you just saw uh, in our approach actually matches very well with the uh, observed measurement. And the CMS experiment actually only used the 2015 data set, which is just a couple of weeks of running. Uh, so we are really just getting started. So just a few words about the Atlas observation that I was working on. So we also have a really beautiful Trident event display. So the red line is again, the muon that comes from one of the tau leptons. And the three yellow lines are the three charged pions that come from the tau decay. And you can see there's nothing else in the detector, right? The caption to this event display is all charged particle tracks above 100 mega electron volts are shown. And uh, some of, to, just to highlight some of the other novel features of this, it takes one month to collect and therefore double the data set. We expect to be collecting uh, the equivalent amount of data uh, later this year in November. Uh, the additional hadronic interactions every time the bunches uh, pass each other called pile up uh, is a factor of 10 to the four smaller than in our proton uh, usual proton collisions and this actually allows us to lower these trigger thresholds all the way down to four giga electron volt which is basically on threshold with our experiments now in atlas we actually went a little bit further we analyzed two other uh, event uh, topologies so what you just saw is actually uh, what we have is this one muon and three track uh, selection that's targeting this three pi on decay. And this is actually the middling statistics, right? And uh, there's actually a much cleaner channel, which is the muon and electron channel where the upper tau decays from an electron, much cleaner, the signal to background is much higher, but the statistics is a bit lower. And then there's the one muon, one track selection targeting this one pi on decay, the pi on, a single pion decay is actually the highest branch ratio of the tau leptons. That's why the statistics is the highest, but there's also a little bit more background here. The signal to background is 
the, the lowest among the three that we chose. And just to show you one plot with the data and the expectation, you can see here, this is the muon transverse momentum. We go all the way down to the threshold. You can see this is where the cross section is the largest. That's where we have the most number of events down to four giga electron volts. That's our detectability threshold in Atlas. And uh, that's because the muons actually lose about three giga electron volts of energy before they even reach the muon chambers. That's a fun fact I learned during uh, my PhD. And you can see the white region here. This is the signal, gamma, gamma, to tau, tau. And you can see just the, the signal to background, even in the one with the lowest signal to background ratio, the muon plus one track signal region, still extremely clean here. The dominant background coming from uh, dimuon production, where, for example, one of the muons might uh, radiate a photon uh, and uh, the photons convert into an electron that can be misidentified with the track. So putting this all together, uh, this is the, the plot that summarizes the, these measurements of the tau g minus two now. These are really groundbreaking results that are competitive with a lepton collider. This is the first laboratory measurement of, of the tau g minus two in two decades, uh, a bit similar to the uh, muon g minus two. And when we were talking to our nuclear physics colleagues, they actually realized this is the first time they had even observed tau leptons in heavy ion collisions. And I remember when we first put out our proposal paper, people were actually a bit skeptical that we could do this in heavy ion collisions. And so it's really beautiful to be able to show them this plot and tell them that we have now made a scent level measurement of a foundational uh, coupling, the gyromagnetic ratio of the tau lepton uh, that is competitive with lab. So it's, it's, this is the, the plot that summarizes that. Now, looking a little bit into the future, just a few words uh, on the high luminosity upgrade, which is actually what I spend a lot of my time doing now. So this will collect about 20 times the data over 20 years. And one of the uh, most core cornerstone parts of the, this upgrade program are these new silicon cameras will replace the entire silicon tracking detectors at the heart of both the Atlas and CMS collaborations. And this will really open up really ultra granular images to probe the microcosm. So in Atlas, this is the inner tracker detector. I work on these silicon strip sensors. This is what they look like. They're about 10 by 10 centimeters. And we put about 14 on one of these local support structures uh, on both sides. So that's 28 per uh, what we call staves. And then we mount all these staves on uh, in this simulation picture here. So just to show you some of these two, two these numbers right between today and what we have, we'll have in about five or six years time, we'll nearly triple the total area of the silicon that we'll have compared with today. And the number of readout channels we'll have goes up by an order of magnitude. And just to show you a bit of a timeline here. So you know, I joined this upgrade project around the end of 2021. We were just entering this dress rehearsal phase called pre-production. Um, and we are slowly transitioning to the production phase, very excitingly uh, building the things that will actually go into the, the uh, detector. Now, it's astonishing to see these timelines, and we will actually only install this in 2028, and only in about six years' time, that's when today's undergrads become postdocs. That is actually when we'll start collecting data with these uh, sensors. So just to show you a schematic of what I actually get up to, uh, we build these little 10 by 10 centimeter modules of the silicon cameras by receiving parts from three different continents, right? Hamamatsu, the Japanese, uh, create the sensors, Birmingham produce the hybrids, and the power boards that power the uh, sensor comes from Berkeley. So the hybrids do the readout of the uh, detector here. So we glue them on. And then once we've glued them on, we do some quality control to check that we glue them in the right place, the metrology. And then we, uh, next, we electrically couple the sensor to the uh, circuit boards here. That's wire bonding, and then we do some thermal and electrical tests here before we ship them out to the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in the UK, where they are mounted, the 14 on each side, onto these local support structures called staves. And in total, we'll need to make about 11,000 of these modules on the 400 of these staves. And the specific Cambridge level that we're doing is we're testing 3,000 of these sensors and building 1,000 of these modules plus about 10% yield. So just to show you a little photo montage, show you how much fun we have. So I get to dress up 
uh, very much like the scientist emoji. And you can see this is what we have to do when we glue the things, right? We really do use uh, liquid glue. There's a two-part glue that hardens. We spread it over a stencil here on the rear of the circuit boards before we glue it down. Here is myself doing a bit of wire bonding. Uh, and this is the testing part, right? You really are just uh, plugging in cables uh, using high voltage power supplies before we package them up uh, to ship them off to the Rutherford lab. And here are some group pictures here uh, of us having lots of fun. And I think that the message I want to send here is that every innovation that we make uh, really strengthens the case for the high Lumi program. So when I propose this, uh, this new method to measure the tau g minus two, uh, this is now uh, picked up by this snow mass, which is what the US are doing, uh, thinking about the future of particle physics. And in there, they were they cited us as uh, a reason to continue running heavy ion collisions throughout the high velocity upgrade, right? So down here, you can see the timeline into the 2030s, and that every dark green bar here, we're running one month of heavy ions. and just a few years ago, these dark green bars were actually not there, right? So there was actually no very little physics case uh, a few years ago to run heavy ions at the high Lumia LHC. Uh, however, our processes are actually statistically limited right now. And you can actually see CMS already made a projection uh, using an order of magnitude more data. And this is the kind of scaling that we get the improvement uh, in the uh, measurement precision here. And if there are also plots like this that looks for axion-like particles, right? so the horizontal axis is the mass of the axion-like particle, and the vertical axis is the interaction strength with photons. And so you can see that this light-by-light -light scattering process that I alluded to earlier uh, actually has some very competitive searches capable uh, using this heavy ion approach, uh, especially using these ELISE detectors and LHCB because they, they have much lower trigger thresholds. So, on that note of talking about axion-like particles, I want to switch gears to the second part of my talk, where I'll uh, present the bread experiment, this new axion detector, an R&D uh, program that, we're, that I was involved in at Chicago. So just to set the scene, I have been focusing on the weak scale so far. This is traditionally where these WIMP-like dark matter, these weakly interactive massive particles, uh, are being sought after. So uh, the, this is where the dark matter particle behaves a lot like a particle. It can strike nuclei, causing these uh, nuclei to recoil, uh, and uh, they behave a lot like billiard balls. And one of the canonical approaches to detect these is, of course, the, these liquid uh, noble experiments. So this is the LZ experiment, where there's this the S1 and S2 signal here, the scintillation light uh, that comes in. Uh, and we can also look for these directly being produced at colliders. This is a monojet event display uh, that uh, the dark matter particle is produced and recoils against a uh, large energetic uh, spray of hadrons called a jet. But the axial light particles that I want to be talking about now live at much lower masses uh, and uh, they behave a lot more like a wave. Uh, and indeed a bit more like a classical field. And I think the, the, analog the analogy here is certainly not a billiard ball, but a bit more like a radio. Right? So this, is, this behaves a lot more like a radio field of, of axion dark matter particles. And we're actually building these detectors that are a lot like antennas trying to listen to the axion dark matter radio. So one of the canonical experiments is the ADMX experiment, the axion dark matter experiment. This is located in Seattle, Washington. Um, and uh, I just want to present also the uh, canonical motivation for the axion, which is, of course, trying to not just solve the dark matter problem, uh, but also back in the 70s, solving this strong charge parity problem, which is really asking the question of why the strong force can, seems to conserve charge parity. Because there's this additional term in the uh, QCD Lagrangian that uh, actually violates charge parity, and the observational effect of this is that the neutron has uh, an electric dipole. However, measurements of trying to search for the neutron electric dipole moment uh, has actually set some astonishing constraints that it's compatible with zero to better than parts per billion. And so the 
story of the Axion dark matter experiment, ADMX, is a real success story, I would say. They are now one of the only experiments that are decisively testing these canonical Axion targets. So the KSDZ and the DFSZ are these canonical models that connect uh, these, uh, these strong CP, these QCD axions that solve the strong CP problem uh, to this uh, diphoton interaction here. And so this is zoomed into the region in which they are sensitive to, the microwave region, uh, both in mass and the frequency down here. And so these colored regions are where they have sensitivity. So th these are these canonical targets that they are uh, sensitive to. However, this approach that they use is a resonant approach. Uh, they, they have these resonant microwave cavities as a long-standing problem where once you go to higher masses, the power uh, scaling is very poor with, um, with mass, right? because it scales to the volume here. And so because we were, we were trying to uh, produce this, uh, confine these axions into these cavities, you, to go to higher masses, the wavelength shrinks, of course, and uh, therefore you have to build smaller cavities, and that's why the power drops so quickly. Right? So the power actually decreases by all, three orders of magnitude if you try to go one order of magnitude higher. Uh, so there's a, this, this is this uh, generation two ADMX experiment that tries to compensate for this by building multiple cavities. This is what it uh, will look like. And there's a big open question about what uh, the feasibility of this really breaks down as we try to go to much higher uh, frequencies. And if you kind of step back to look at the bigger picture here, so this is the, again, the axial photon coupling as a function of the mass. We were zoomed into this little ADMX region here. There are other experiments also trying to push down here. These are these resonant cavity experiments. And uh, this is the this QC axion band. It's more like a bit of a haze here. There's all sorts of models that you can actually uh, predict along this band uh, based on different assumptions about the early universe production of these axions, these pre and post inflationary scenarios. And these high mass uh, searches are trying to probe these uh, post inflationary scenarios that are quite well motivated. But you can see that the other problem when you're trying to do searches, uh, so the LHC, you know, we can search over several orders of magnitude and you can just do these little bump hunts. This resonant cavity approach, uh, you're sitting on uh, these very narrow ranges of mass and you just try to integrate lots of time you try and beat down the, the noise. And this is just, it becomes very untenable when you want to search over a wide, much wider range, right? And uh, to make it more precise, the scan rate uh, as they try to tune the frequency at which the scan goes scales nearly to the inverse power of five. Uh, so that if you try to double the frequency you're trying to search for, you have to run for nearly 20 times as long. So we really need creativity to, I think, overcome these uh, narrowband resonant cavity approaches. So there have been some innovative ideas in the past 10 years or so trying to look at this slightly higher mass regime above the microwave frequencies. One approach is this dish antenna approach. Uh, which is quite radical at the time when they proposed this 10 years ago, uh, where you just simply get rid of this resonant uh, problem. There is no uh, narrow band resonance you're trying to use to enhance the signal. And you replace this with a giant uh, mirror that produces these photons and you can focus it to a point. Uh, so this is a truly broadband approach to, to convert the dark matter into photons. Uh, and one of the other uh, ways uh, to try and resolve this problem is the so-called dielectric stack. So this is also using a mirror to convert these axions into photons, but they try to compensate for the lack of resonance uh, to try and improve the, uh, the signal rate by having these stacks of di dielectric disks that will also emit photons and they will uh, constructively add up uh, to, to provide this boost to the signal here. So the power now scales a coupling squared and the area, the total area being emitting, emitting these photons, uh, and then you can pick it up at a receiver. So just to show you that I think one of the more, more, most exciting aspects about this program is that in the past few years, we've been seeing several proof of principle pilots of these two kinds of approaches to try and go to the higher masses. So there have been a few realizations of this so-called dish antenna approach uh, going by various uh, funny and funky acronyms here. Uh, you can even use gauge groups as the first letter of your uh, uh, acronym here. Very nice. Uh, 
uh, as well as the dielectric stacks, Mad Max, lamppost, two very different regimes, uh, lamppost at the uh, near infrared regime, Mad Max uh, just above the microwave regime. And uh, I think this is really a proof of concept that this uh, approach is very viable. Now, this is where the bread collaboration comes in, the broadband reflector experiment of axion detection. We want to try and optimize this whole program in the US. And so we put out this proposal paper that was uh, very nicely published on the cover of PRL uh, last year. And when I told this good news to my collaborators, they were both excited, but also a little bit skeptical, because if you actually look very closely, this somehow ended up on the April Fool's edition of uh, PRL, but I had to reassure them this was not uh, a joke. So the first step in this uh, dish antenna program is converting these axions into photons. So this is to make it more precise how we actually do it is by this uh, Lagrangian term here where we have the axion photon coupling, the axion field coupled to this uh, anti-symmetric contraction of the photon field strength. And the Feynman diagram realization is that in the presence of a B field, these axions will turn into photons. Now in the non-relativistic limit, the consequence in the laboratory is that there is an additional source term here in the Ampere-Maxwell equation uh, that, that uh, is uh, oscillatory, and the oscillation frequency is proportional to the mass of the axion. And the consequence of this is that due to Faraday's law, there's this continuity equation that we have to satisfy on the parallel component of the electric field on conductors. The, the consequence of this is that the, all conducting surfaces will actually now start spontaneously emitting photons in the presence of a magnetic field uh, that's perpendicular to, to the normal of the conductor, right? And microscopically what's going on is that the axion field is actually uh, jiggling these electrons in your metal uh, and that's what's causing the photons to be emitted. Now, one of the, the shortcomings of some of the dish antennas that I showed you a little bit earlier is that uh, they're very difficult to put inside a cryostat and these large field magnets, right? Because they are all cylindrical in geometry. So this is why we wanted to make our conductor cylindrical uh, to try and uh, convert the axions into photons. Now, the next step is to try and collect the photons once you've got the cylindrical geometry that you can stick into a cryostat and a standard solenoid. And this is where we turned to some 19th century inspiration. This is actually a classical optics problem that was solved in a very, very different context of trying to build lighthouses. So they actually solve the inverse problem of what we had. So they have point sources, this furnace here, and they want to create these cylindrically symmetric parallel rays of light. And so it turns out using these parabolic shapes here, uh, that's how you can solve this problem. And we actually have the inverse problem where we have lots of inward emitting photons uh, coming from a cylindrically symmetric geometry that we want to focus to a point. So I just want to give a shout out to some of the undergraduate summer students at Fermilab that were leading a lot of these simulation studies, Kate, Gabe, and Matthew, they've all gone to do PhDs now. Really great to see. So there, there are two limits that you can consider here. One is this ray optics limit at very high frequencies near the infrared regime. So you can run just some standard ray tracing simulations to confirm that indeed it's focused to a point. And just a, a side remark that it, it's the, the point, the focal point is actually smeared a little bit due to the non-zero halo velocity. The non-zero halo velocity actually causes the submission to be slightly deviating from the normal of the cylinder. And now the low mass regime, this is where the waves become, uh, the, the wavelength becomes a lot longer. This is a simulation that we can solve numerically Maxwell's equations with this axion field. And this is a picture at 15 gigahertz where you can see that uh, it also indeed is focused to a spot here. The final step is to try and detect these photons. And this is where this whole quantum technology comes in because these are very rare processes that we need very low uh, noise sensors for. So this is a table that I compiled in the paper looking at some of the state-of-the-art detection technologies in the energy range that we're interested in here. That's the first column here. And the operating temperature, the noise equivalent power, which is engineering, electrical engineering jargon for just noise. Right, and then the active area of the sensor. So you can see that the commercial bolometers, so bolometers are just fancy thermometers, 
And you can buy room temperature as well as cryogenic versions. And you can see that there's a six order of magnitude improvement in noise just by going cryogenic. There are these state-of-the-art detectors built in the astronomy community called transition edge sensors and kinetic inductance detectors. This is what we consider established technology uh, that can be built and fabricated in university labs. That's this row here. And you can see the noise performance is another five orders of magnitude better. And then there are some of these um, emerging technologies uh, specifically for photon counting in the infrared regime, quantum capacitance detectors, superconducting nanowires, and these have exceptionally low dark count rates. Uh, this is the regime where we, we talk about dark count rates here. So the, the goal of this paper was really just to put all these ingredients together and summarize the sensitivity that, uh, project the sensitivity that we would have if you just built all these things together. So uh, one of the staged approaches that we uh, have here is to first run a pilot uh, search, uh, what you might refer to as a sourdough starter, right, to prove that the bread is feasible. Uh, and this is looking for these dark photons. Uh, so this is where you do not require a magnet and the, uh, the, metallical, the metallic surfaces will just spot spontaneously emit photons here. So we have the dark photon interaction with our standard model photon on the y-axis and then the mass of the dark photon on the horizontal axis. And so you can see using uh, even commercial devices, you can start to probe into uh, unprobed parameter space here, right? So the blue is the existing constraints and are uh, using state-of-the-art quantum sensors. You can see several orders of magnitude of improvement in coupling across several orders of magnitude of mass. And uh, very excited to say that we might be uh, collecting our first data later this year. And then we can move on to the axion interactions here. So this is a bit more difficult to do. Uh, and this is where we will require some R&D efforts. So you can see the dashed line here is this 1,000 days on the assumption that the noise can be improved by two orders of magnitude. So that will require some significant R&D, something that could come in the next five or so years. So just to show you what vision we might have. So this is this will be located around the Chicago area at Fermilab, potentially. Uh, you can see this kind of staged table that I made in our paper here, where you do the dark photon search first, and then you find a magnet, you put it in a magnet to do the axion search here. And we also contributed to this snow mass white paper process that's ongoing in the US. So this is a lovely rendering done by Don Mitchell of what this might look like. So you might imagine a facility that the infrastructure of the cryogenics and the magnets are provided by the facility, uh, one of the uh, buildings in Fermilab. And on the one side, you might have one of the ADMX upgrades to probe in the microwave regime. And then there could be some space to put the bread uh, detector here on the other side of this sort of, uh, solenoid magnet. So just to show you some of the hands-on work as an experimentalist that we were doing in Chicago. So one of the first things that I was up to was trying to build a spectrometer for our calibration of optics. And uh, this arrived in 2020. You see these nice boxes, building the dark box with Kristen Doner. She was the first year PhD student at the time. And COVID, of course, happened here. We couldn't access the labs for several months. And then only in the summer could we go in and actually build our spectrometer, uh, see some nice fringes, and then take measurements. To and this is a nice plot that Kristen made, uh, showing that we can actually uh, measure some of these lines here of a filter that we would use to calibrate our detectors. So we wrote this up and published this in the Journal of Instrumentation. And this is all funded by this uh, Department of Energy uh, grant that tries to promote these synergies between high energy physics and the quantum information science communities. Now, the second part is to try and test these quantum sensors that I was alluding to earlier. So here is myself and Kristen here at the Fermilab Silicon Detector Lab. This is one of the cryostats that we have. And we uh, were testing some of these MIT uh, nanowires. So these are sensors where they're superconducting, and if they absorb a photon, uh, they, th this breaks the Cooper pairs and the superconductivity is lost. And this it, uh, basically blocks the current, and so the current has to go down this amplifier here. That's how you see this uh, spike in the signal here. And so these are some of the first clicks that we were seeing uh, on the screen here. And Kristen was showing a poster about this last year at iChat. Now, one of the cool things about this cryostat is that this little 
circle here. You can actually open up and you mount the sensors on this gold rectangle here, um, and you can actually shine laser light onto the sensor here. And this is actually one of the plots down here showing the dark count rates in red and the photon count rate of this laser light uh, shining onto the sensor to calibrate our sensor. This is work that's being led by Christina, one of the PhD students at Caltech working on this. And the final hands-on part that I just want to briefly flash up is the reflector. We're now very excited to actually have some of these prototype parts that have been machined on conventional lathes here. So this is what you see here. You can start bolting them together. You can start to uh, check uh, using, so we do some quality control to check that we can indeed focus the light on a point. It's a bit smeared out, so it's not perfect here. You do some metrology onto it. And these are some of the residuals with respect to the design spec. So you can see we, we managed to manufacture it within a few micron of the specification. And, just, and this is some work that was led by uh, another summer undergrad student, uh, Huma. And just some of the pictures of potential magnets we could use. So Andrew Sonnenschein, the lead PI of this project, uh, found a magnet at Argon, the four Tesla magnet that we could potentially use, as well as there's a 9.4 Tesla, 80 centimeter bore solenoid at the University of Illinois, Chicago. This is actually a professor who was working on more biological sciences uh, who had to retire and they just had this huge uh, liquid helium cooled magnet that they needed to get rid of. And so it was actually easier to move that to Fermilab than to try and create or purchase our own. And I just want to uh, reflect on just how interdisciplinary this uh, project really is. It really spans uh, the astronomy community as well as the quantum technology community. And one of our collaborators was based at NASA and he was actually introduced me to this uh, infrared telescope uh, that could be coming online in a couple of decades time, the Origin Space Telescope. And it was actually really fascinating to hear how they were developing these quantum technologies, these very low noise photon sensors in this infrared regime we're trying to look at, but for extremely different science motivations, right? So as a particle physicist, I'm interested in looking at, at dark matter. They're interested, of course, in looking at how the early universe formed, how these uh, prototypical, uh, sorry, these protoplanetary systems uh, were forming, as well as trying to look for signatures of uh, life on other planets. So I think just to echo some of the, the American snowmass process, you know, to think outside the box, make connections to other fields, and the European strategy has been trying to compel us to strengthen the synergies between particle and astroparticle physics. So in the last a uh, couple of minutes, I just want to end on another history of science story to tie everything together. And I want to tell you the story about the neutron magnetic moment, uh, because this is when nature simply laughed in our faces. Right? So when Dirac uh, originally wrote his equation, uh, James Chadwick, just down the road from where I live, discovered the neutron a couple of years later. And so with these uh, discoveries in mind, you could ask, well, does it have a magnetic moment, right? And so the theory expectation is that it's zero. It's a neutral and point-like particle. Why would it have a magnetic moment? Surely you're wasting your time trying to measure one. But when they measured it, they found it was actually large and just laugh in our human faces. Nature decided to make it negative as well. So this defied and completely confounded expectation. People did not believe the measurements for many years. And of course, we now know this was the first indirect evidence for new physics, nuclear substructure, a new confining force, strong force. And people were, you could easily have asked, right, what applications would this have to our everyday life? This is some effect that's happening 15 orders of magnitude smaller than myself. Well, today we now use the very effect of nuclear magnetic moments to save lives with MRI medical imaging. But nature has the last laugh. And the solution to the neutron magnetic dipole moment problem, QCD, the strong force, itself has a new problem with the electric dipole moment that we were uh, discussing uh, in, in, for the axions, right? And this is where the electric dipole moment, uh, the expectation is that there uh, should be strong CD violation, it should be large. The reality is that this is very small and perhaps this could be new physics once again, perhaps axions. So I want to end by just saying that I think these stories and all these papers and results and exciting detectors I want to build could really compel us to keep looking at nature in ways we've never done before, even if, and as the story of the neutron teaches us, especially if it completely defies expectation. So thank you very much for listening.
Thank you very much for a really interesting and very diverse um, talk. Do we have any questions? I think we have a few minutes. Uh, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll go first. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting talk. Um, can I ask a bit about what the, for, for bread, what the um, the data will look like? Are you, do you plan to basically just sort of uh, collect photon counts essentially and and by using the counts as a function of frequency that will be your detection because you don't really have i mean in the case of like a scanning resonant experiment it's very clear you have a you know huge signal when you get the right frequency whereas is this more like a rare event type search yeah so so for the search phase we don't plan to have that much uh, mass resolution uh, these detectors are just uh, detecting counts um, across the range of the frequencies. Um, there are some discussions that we're having in our collaboration of trying to do what the astronomers do, which is to add a spectrometer. Right? So this is what actually originally motivated us to try and build a spectrometer. It's actually quite difficult to build a, a cryogenic spectrometer. And this is why we're trying to uh, calibrate how well we could resolve certain lines. So this is how a, a axion or dark photon would look like if we had spectral resolution. Um, so we could potentially use a diffraction grating or this kind of Michelson-like interferometer, but the first search phase will just be integrated counts. And then for future upgrades, we might consider adding a spectrometer to have mass resolution, which will also improve the discovery sensitivity. So that, that's a great question, thanks. And um, in the um, this this first phase that you, you're sort of hopeful will have this, this year, um, what is the the detector in that case? So we have two pilots, one that is in the uh, about 20 gigahertz regime, that's just a bit down here, and the other one is in the infrared regime, uh, so that's what we'll be using the superconducting nanowires up here. So we're starting at regimes that we understand quite well, which is the infrared and the microwave regime uh, for our two pilot experiments. the question i've got a question about the uh, tau minus two um tau yep. G minus two. um you saw uh, you had these events where you showed where that you actually want the ones where the ions kind of miss each other what's the fraction of collisions which produce these events so the, the cross sections for these processes are actually very large. There, there are a few microbarn as uh, CMS measured, uh, and it's actually um, it's an, yeah it's actually comparable fractions of these events that miss each other. These so-called elastic ultra peripheral collisions uh, are compared with the direct hadronic interactions, because actually quite a substantial probability uh, these ions or protons will actually miss each other as they as the bunches uh, pass through each other. So it's actually quite a substantial cross-section uh, that are elastic. Great, great question. Okay. And maybe I can follow on. Um, well, from before the, the data you expect, kind of before the long shutdown, how much, mm -hmm. how much better do you think you can um, do with this measurement? Yeah, that's a great question. And so we expect to take another month of data this uh, year, this is November, and so that would double the data set. And there should be another run uh, in about two years' time before the long shutdown. So we should have quadruple our data set with the heavy ion data sets. And because our measurements are currently statistically limited, um, we should expect just naively a factor of two improvement. Uh, but another improvement we can make is, of course, in the analysis, we're only triggering on the muons, uh, but the the towels also decay to electrons uh, the same amount of time. So we could potentially nearly double the data set just by adding, for example, electrons into our analysis. They're a bit trickier, electrons, but uh, we're hopeful that with this combination of increased statistics, uh, we might get factors of three or maybe even four improvement if we're optimistic. It's a great question, thanks. Does anyone else have... Any questions, either just unmute or raise hands, whatever you prefer. Um, yeah, I also wanted to ask, can you go back to the um, 
the the plot where you're showing all of the different measurements of the uh, like I guess tau g minus two, uh, yeah, this one. Um, so, uh, what what are the uh, so okay, what so what is uh, expected first of all? Is that is this with uh, more atlas data in the kind of in the foreseeable future? Is or is there something else? Yeah. So yeah, expected is a kind of LHC jargon for uh, if you don't look at the data points, this is the sensitivity that we would expect. So this is the kind of blinded sensitivity that we would have. And when you open the box and actually look at the data points, the data can be a little bit above or below the expectation. Uh, and therefore the, the corresponding sensitivity might be a bit less or, or better. So we had a little excess and that's why uh, our observed sensitivity is a little bit worse than expected. So that's, uh, that's what that means. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess my, my my question is is um it is it, it, like I guess this 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 method of measuring g minus two of the tau is uh it has the virtue that you're you know you're actually doing it um, but if like I really really wanted to get like a super precise measurement of g minus two for the tau like you know with some of these other proposals that people have made is this heavy ion collisions really the way to go or is there like is there a limit to sort of how far you could push this with the with the heavy ion collisions technique. Yeah, that's a great question. So, of course, we still haven't, we're still in order of magnitude away from testing the, the one loop Schwinger term. And it, yeah, I mean, I think my gut feeling is that the heavy iron approach uh, is cute and it's very nice. Uh, you know, it makes for a nice story to tell, um, nice marketing, but I don't think it will be the ultimate word on the tau G minus two. I think there are some other proposals, for example, using proton beams or electron beams that I think uh, have certain reasons why we might expect better sensitivity. So for example, protons, they can ha access higher energies and that actually allows the, the, the rate of change of cross-section as a function of G minus two to be faster. Um, so that could be another extension uh, to our program here. Um, and of course there are experiments like Bell two that are just starting to take its first data uh, with some first results out that uh, will have really an astonishing uh, statistics uh, that might be able to uh, compete as well, but the it's the the jury is out right now, and there's no consensus on what is the best way to uh, make progress here, and that's kind of what makes it interesting. It's a great question. Thanks. All right, I don't see any other questions. So maybe we'll end here.